Hello. In this video, I'd like to talk about a simple, but seasonal, electronics project that I've been working on recently. It's this set of miniature fairy lights for a very small Christmas tree. There are 32 warm white LEDs strung around the plant, arranged into four groups of eight LEDs each. Each of the four groups can be controlled independently, allowing for various twinkling, chasing, or flashing effects. This small box drives the fairy lights, using an AT Tiny 2313 microcontroller and some basic support circuitry. The button can be used to advance to the next effect in the current mode. The lights are currently in a mode where they will switch to a new random effect after a random interval, so pressing the button advances to a random effect. Holding the button down changes the mode. In this mode, the fairy lights are at a fixed certain brightness, and pressing the button cycles between eight different levels. The final mode displays a single animated effect, and does not advance automatically to a random one. Pressing the button steps through the animated effects in order. Whilst this is a fairly simple project, there were still some interesting challenges to work through. The first was to find a way to power a string of eight LEDs. Now the simplest way to do this is to use a series circuit with a single current limiting resistor for all of the LEDs. Now, if we assume that the forward voltage drop across each LED is 3 volts, and there are 8 LEDs, then this would require a 24 volt supply to power each string. Now, as I was intending to run the circuit off a 5 volt supply, uh, there would need to be some way to produce that 24 volts. However, if we were to use a parallel uh, circuit for each of the LEDs, then we wouldn't need that 24 volt supply, but we would need a current limiting resistor on each individual LED. Now, as the intention is to make each string as small as possible, or as simple as possible, having a resistor on each LED would be a complete pain to assemble. So bearing in mind that the series arrangement seems to be the most simple, we'll need to find a way to produce that 24 volts. And how did I do that? Well, let's take a look inside this control box to find out. Power comes in via this two-pin header, where it is regulated by this 7805 linear regulator to 5 volts. This power supply is connected to the microcontroller, an AT Tiny 2313, which controls the operation of the device. This cluster of diodes and capacitors is a Dixon charge pump, which is used to provide the 24 volts required by the LEDs. The Dixon charge pump is a simple circuit that charges up a sequence of capacitors using two clock signal inputs and a series string of diodes to ensure that the voltage increases in one direction only through the circuit. This schematic shows a five-stage Dixon charge pump, as used in the fairy lights, but to illustrate how it works I'll reduce it to two stages. Each stage increases the output voltage by the input voltage minus the voltage drop incurred by the diode. If we assume this voltage drop is zero, then a two-stage charge pump will triple the input voltage. In the first step, the lower clock line is connected to ground, and the upper clock line is connected to the positive supply voltage. This causes the 5-volt input voltage in the top left to flow through the leftmost diode into the leftmost capacitor, charging it up to 5 volts. The rightmost capacitor is connected to 5 volts on both its upper and lower plates, so it is not charged, and the total output is 5 volts. We now invert both clock lines so that the lower clock line is connected to the positive supply voltage and the upper clock line is connected to ground. The lower plate of the leftmost capacitor is now at 5 volts, but as it was previously charged to 5 volts, the upper plate is now at 10 volts with respect to ground. As this 10 volts is higher than the 5 volt input in the top left, current does not flow through the leftmost diode, 
but it does flow through the rightmost one and charges the rightmost capacitor to 10 volts. The total output is now 10 volts. We now invert both clock lines again to the initial state with the lower clock line connected to ground and the upper clock line connected to the positive supply voltage. The lower plate on the rightmost capacitor is now connected to 5 volts again, but as we charged it to 10 volts in the previous step, the upper plate is now at 15 volts with respect to ground, making the output of the charge pump 15 volts. The leftmost capacitor can now be charged back up to 5 volts, and the cycle will continue, the output maintaining a peak voltage of 15 volts. The final stage of the Dixon charge pump does not increase the voltage, but is a peak detector to maintain the highest output voltage from the previous stage. Exact component values will depend on the intended use of the charge pump, as will clock frequency. Too high a frequency will not give the capacitors enough time to charge up in each state. However, too low a frequency will allow the load to drain the charge capacitors long before they are charged up again, which, in the case of driving LEDs, causes noticeable flicker. In my case, I found a combination of 1N4001 rectifier diodes and 330 nanofarad ceramic capacitors worked well. Schottky diodes would no doubt be more efficient due to their lower voltage drop, but I didn't have any to hand. I can demonstrate how the voltage increases at each stage with my multimeter. At this point, it is 7.1 volts. At the next, it is 11.8. 16.4, 21.0, 25.6, and finally 27.7 volts. The output of the charge pump is connected to the string of LEDs via this pin on this 5-pin header, and these four other pins are connected to the ends of the four series circuits. Each circuit has a current limiting resistor, and is switched on and off via one of these four NPN transistors. Four PWM outputs are used from the microcontroller to control the brightness of each of the four LED circuits, and though the microcontroller could easily sync the amount of current required to illuminate the LEDs, it can only alternate its PWM outputs between ground and the supply voltage, which in this case is 5 volts. The higher voltage used to drive the LEDs means that current will still flow through them when the output from the microcontroller is high, hence the necessity of this transistor stage. The last component on the circuit board is this 6-pin header, used to program the microcontroller. The software running on the microcontroller is reasonably simple. Two timers are used to control the PWM outputs and periodically run the animation code to update the LED brightnesses, according to the current effect. One problem with the PWM output is that the perceived LED brightness does not have a linear relationship with the percentage of time that it is switched on. That is, the increase in brightness between an LED that is PWM driven at 1%, then 2%, is quite significant, whereas the difference in brightness between an LED that is driven at 90%, then 100%, is barely noticeable at all. My solution was to implement a form of slow software PWM on top of the fast hardware PWM. This means that a request for 1% brightness results in the LEDs being switched on for 1% of 1% of the time, a hundredth of 1% in other words. A request for 10% brightness results in the LEDs being switched on for 10% of 10% of the time, or 1% total, and a request for 50% brightness results in the LEDs being switched on for 50% of 50% of the time, which is a 25% total. This produces a much more usable brightness curve, though it still favours the low end of the scale. In any case, the results seem reasonable enough, and the software should be quite easy to modify should you wish to create your own version of the project. There should be a link to more information, documentation, schematics, and code in the video description below. If you are watching this video around Christmas time and you celebrate Christmas, then I hope you have a happy one. And if you're not watching this around Christmas time, then I hope you had a happy one. Thank you for watching.